This is week two of Catholic Lecture 56 on healthy and unhealthy motives in desire. And this section is about how there are constructive and destructive life forces. In contrast to the constructive life force, there is the destructive life force emanating from confusion, ignorance, and wrong motives. Your personality registers extremely accurately all desires, tendencies, and motives. Although you may not be consciously aware of this registration, unconsciously it is there. If you have certain wrong and confused motives that may be self-serving and to the detriment of others, be it ever so subtle. Destructive currents are the result. These destructive currents either prohibit the particular conscious wish, wish itself, or they affect further fulfillment, the desire for which may not be conscious. Deep within yourself, you know there is something wrong, and therefore you say to yourself, though not in conscious thought, I do not deserve that which I wish. Um, last night I did a small video and uh, it's a newer uh, time date thing and nobody showed up. So I did it by myself. And um, my impression, internal, my impression is that when I speak to actual human beings, I'm connected. When I'm just talking to a camera, it's like I'm walking on ice. I'm not, I'm not completely connected, and I feel like I slosh and slide. I feel like the point is sliding away from me, and then I have to pull myself back. So I noticed in particular, because of this series I'd started, that over, I think there's been seven so far, over seven uh, video recordings, I have felt energized and positive, and I thought I, I did well the first take. I didn't obviously didn't do any uh, retakes of that. And then last night, I was just slipping and sliding all over the place, and I sincerely noticed the difference. I'm bringing that up because number one's current in my memory and I'm trying to figure out how to fix that because if the time date isn't popular, I'd like to keep it because man, it really helped my videos. Um, but secondly, it's an example of being aware of something, not knowing exactly what it is or why it's happening. All you have is the effect. This is the effect of something. I, I don't know what it's the effect of. I can't name it. I can't verbalize it. I can feel it. And I had felt it in the past, which is why I stopped making the videos. Um, I started having to do two and three retakes and thought something, something's not right here. Um, so there I am in my process of having to figure out what's going on. Now, that may not be destructive, that's okay, but it's, and it may be constructive to do the process. But that's the element that I forgot to speak about last night, which is a serious point in the lecture. And that is, even if it's constructive, we're allowed to follow through on our examination and our exploration of what um, is going on. And... If it's destructive, we will be led to continue to focus on it. If it's constructive, let's call it an interesting, gee, isn't that interesting? And I don't know what it is. But if it's destructive, we're going to be motivated to continue to address it. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use a real life event to punctuate the lectures to make a point, uh, because that's what the lectures are for. 
They are not for intellectual discussion, which is why I do not like uh, discussion circles. Um, I think this, I think that, I think the other. Um, instead, what I love about this work is the invitation to go deeper, e even if there's nothing to find. The question is, why are you motivated to look? To honor the motivation, that little wiggle inside you that says, I'm not sure and I want to make sure. I I suspect and I want to erase my suspicions. Um, I have a feeling something's there. I looked, I couldn't find it. Uh, think of it this way too. In real life, um, uh, uh, in the news nowadays, there's a lot of cold cases that are being solved because we have more science. And the detectives who uh, help the journalists write these stories will tell them, we tried, we did everything. We looked and we examined, we used everything at our disposal at that time. And we came up with nothing. And it, there's other things to do. And you don't know what day the science exists that will help you solve your case. But for a lot of people, 20, 30 years later, especially if a case stays with them, and these detectives in particular, I notice, they'll say things like, could never let go of that. Just, I couldn't let go of how the mother looked. I couldn't let go of the feeling about the picture of the victim. Um, couldn't let it go. And so they bother to ask questions 20 years later. And sometimes there's still nothing you can do. But the ones that make the news are about the cases where there is something you can do. You now have the means that you didn't have at the time. I'd like to invite you that we are all detectives in our lives. If you like detective stories and mystery stories, you've got a whopper in you. You've got the best detective story of all time. Enjoy. And you may have the means now to do the exploration, the knowledge, the education, the life experience, the experience of doing the work that you didn't have five years ago, 10 years ago. So this I think is the genesis of the idea, well, if I could go back in time five years, I would do this and this and this. The problem is that we're not constructed that way. We were never meant to be constructed that way. The idea is not go back and fix the problem. That wasn't the problem. Sometimes the spiritual message is the things that really matter to you won't get forgotten. You'll do something about it one day. You don't have the tools right now. Have patience, believe in yourself, and wait. If it's not evil intention trying to hide the information, if it's lack of resources and lack of capacity, grow the capacity. So I've told the story where when I was 26 or so, I went to work after staying home with my kids for seven years. And I got slotted into a job that perhaps I was underqualified for, but they, they basically decided we've tried the professionals, let's try this smart kid. Um, and I, I, it, it was my slot. It was something I was phenomenal at. And I started a whole career based on that job. And I remember talking to one of the managers. This company was in terrible shape. And I said to him, I can run this company better than those guys can. And he said to me, yes, you can when you're 40 or in 20 years. I've told this story before. And I thought, you mean I have to sit around and wait 20 years? Well, 20 years later, I was running my own company. What he meant was this. You have the ability, you have the talent, you have the ability to perceive and put things together, but you don't have the life skills you're going to need to work with all the people that are you have to work with. You don't have all the education, real life education or book, either way. You don't have the education to be able to offer substitutions for what people are currently doing, um, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. 
20 years later, I had those materials and I was able to use them. And yes, I could run that company better than the people who were doing it. Consider that you're running your life and your 40-year-old self can run your life a lot better than your 20-year-old self was. But you don't want to replace your 20-year-old self. What they had were ideals, enthusiasm, innocence. They got into situations that you shouldn't have gotten into, but that got you into the situation. So the, I want to go back and fix things is actually wanting to edit your life. Instead, consider now you can write entirely new chapters of your life and you can refresh all the information, all the mistakes, all the boneheaded decisions, all the um, insane things you did when you were a kid. You can do it now. No harm, no foul. And your life becomes richer. So that's what I read out of this lecture. Um, and I may even save this little square and post it as an amendum as I never got my point across last night. So thanks for listening. Um, want to introduce yourselves and we'll get started.